More than 700 new Texas laws went to effect Friday, September 1st. Here are some of the laws that might impact you mo the most. To help us understand these laws, our guest today is Dr. Kevin Stewart, Assistant Professor of Political Science, Director of the Master in Public Policy and Administration Program at the University of St. Thomas, and also is a friend of our TLC, Texas Latino Conservatives, and he's been several times in our program, and we are so honored to have you back, Dr. Stewart. Good morning, welcome to TLC Live. Good morning, Andrea, so great to be back. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Well, today I'm solo. Orlando is in a special assignment, so it's gonna be just you and I, so he's gonna give us more time to talk. <laughs> he normally right. takes over the program. <laughs> So, Dr. Stewart, so September 1st, as every September 1st after the legislature, um, a new laws come in place in Texas. This time, 700, uh, and, I, and I believe it's 704 new Texas laws that stay in place, but uh, some of them are more important, not, not that they're all not important, but some of them impact our life the most. So let's talk about in general how these 700 new laws are gonna uh, take place in Texas and, and now the most important was so the one that is gonna affect us. us. Yes, well, as uh, many of your viewers may already know, the Texas legislature is a part-time legislature. It's not a full-time job. They are in session uh, for less than 150 days every other year. So they're not even in session every year, but rather every other year. And this is one of those years. And so they come together for most of the first half of the year um, to address whatever challenges and policy issues have come up in the intervening two year period since they last met. And they've given us over 700, as you mentioned, new laws that touch upon everything from border security to voter identity to um, child welfare, how that's handled, um, just a wide range. Now, as you mentioned, some of those touch our everyday lives a bit more directly than others. But as you also say, they're all important to somebody. And so it's, it's worth at least knowing what our, what our elected officials have been up to. So, Dr. Stewart, let's um, um, explain, you know, our viewers that they're not familiar with politics. Um, so every year, the legislature meeting, like as you said, it's a part-time job, um, 700 of these ones. And uh, what I'm seeing this year, uh, it's many of that I never saw before, like for example, like the drug queens, and I'm, I'm seeing that SB 12 protect kids from drug shows, and the S, uh, SB 14 bans uh, child gender modification, these kind of new laws, and, 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 and you can correct me, but I never saw it before. Yeah, that's right. So a number of issues that we, we saw several big developments this time in the session. Uh, one of them is, and by way of background, the only thing the legislature is required by law to do during that session is pass a budget. So that is always priority number one they are constitutionally obligated to pass a budget. Um, so they do that. Uh, this, the, that comes into play because that means after that, they can take up any number of issues that have come up before the state. Um, this time we saw a lot of development on the so-called social issues, um, the family related issues, uh, both at the level of um, sort of radical you know, pushing back against radical politics. We see a continuous sorting in the country between uh, blue states and red states, and blue states are sharpening the divisions between themselves and red states, and red states are sharpening their definition as a red state. And you definitely saw <coughs> our legislature in this uh, session take some steps to sharpen the definition of Texas as a red state, uh, where it concerns not only tax policy, but also criminal justice, the border, um, family issues. Um, yeah, the, the drag queen drag shows in public, um, sexually explicit materials in libraries, a variety of issues came up and we can, we can talk through all of those if you want, especially since it's just us too. Exactly, yeah, I wanna, I wanna 
uh, get deep on those because also the SB 15 is a Savings Women's Sport Act. All of these things has to do with that, and it's been all over the news. It's been the headlines, and we're being uh, we're being seeing protesting uh, people protesting on that, and it's been impacting uh, the sports when it comes, especially the the female sports. So let's let's get deep on that because this is a it's like a family values. It's like the the something that I never saw that is being touched in the in the Texas legislature or in any legislature and something that is impacting us every day as parents and as a family and as a society. Yes, so two years ago, I was called multiple times, I think five or six times to testify as an expert witness on issues similar to that one at the legislature. And the big question then as, well, as it was this year was whether you had to participate in sports, in organized sports, according to your biological sex. Now, the reason that's an issue to, to help explain it, I mean, this, it sounds kind of crazy that it would be an issue. Of course, if you're a boy, you participate in the boy division. If you're a girl, you participate in the girl division. But we have people who identify as transgender. And so they identify more with the opposite sex than with the one they were born with. Now, the trouble this creates in sports is that biological males have advantages. There are some advantages for biological males even pre-puberty, but once puberty kicks in, biological males have profound physical advantages in athletic competition over females on average. And so the reason we have, I mean, all this is common sense, but it has to be spelled out. The reason we have sex separate divisions in athletics is because it's deeply unfair in most instances particularly after puberty has kicked in for boys or men to be competing against girls or women. Uh, so what these laws clarify is that uh, in schools, all the way up now through colleges, and that's what the, uh, the legislation this session was about, all the way up through colleges in Texas, you must participate in the division according to your biological sex. How that put us, um in front of the rest of the country. So there are a number of other uh, states doing making similar moves. Um, I think this is this is an issue where there is broad public support for acknowledging the reality of human sexuality that human beings come in male and female, um, and acknowledging the um, the unfairness the damage that it causes to women's sports to have biological males participating in women's sports. And, and again, it's almost always that direction that we see things moving. It's almost always an instance of a biological male seeking to participate in uh, the female or women's division in a particular sport. Um, and so there, there are quite a number of states that are that are aligning around and with Texas on this issue. And then, of course, there are states that, that disagree strongly on it. To me, it seems like uh, before, I mean, like, they were trying to protect everybody, you know, the freedom of everybody to feel whatever they want to feel if they don't feel like a female or they don't feel like a male. And to me, it seems like that they forgot before, before this law, took place, and I think this is very important, that's why this, this law is very important, they forgot that to protect what is, what is common sense, protect what, I mean, if I was born as a woman, if, if you were born as a male, and if you want to participate in any sports as your uh, gender, they forgot to protect that. So they were like more concentrating on other things that, that is not the majority of the population, uh, than protecting the what is what is common sense, what is our values, what is our nature. Yes, yeah, so there there are two big issues, and you you hinted at both of them there uh, regarding having particularly males participate in the female division of sport. One is the competitive advantage that that gives them, um, and there are these profound, ineradicable. You know, men are on average um, six inches taller quite a number of pounds heavier, significantly stronger and faster. It's, it's embarrassing to talk about, right? Um, 
but it, it's just undeniably the case. It's the data is very, very well established and well attested here that men have phys distinct physical advantages when it comes to competition in athletic events with females so that competition between them is largely going to be unfair. And that's why we have uh, men's and women's divisions. And so this is a real threat to the existence of a women's division to have male competitors. And of course, in instances when males have competed in female division, it's not like we have to guess what will happen. It has happened. And it's turned out that even mediocre male athletes um, will actually win in the in the women's division. So we know that that's what will happen. That will be the result. The second real worry, the second real problem here is one of safety. Look, athletic competition, again, that you're absolutely right that this is common sense and it feels strange that you need a professor to sort of lay it out. But in athletic competition, you get hot and sweaty. And so cleaning up involves showering, right? Which involves various stages of undress. Um, and it's dangerous, not to mention, in, you, you know, it's uh, not protective of people's modesty and privacy to have men and women um, showering in the same facility. But that would necessarily be the case if you're going to have males and females competing in the same division, using the same locker room, being treated 100% as identical on the team. So there are these two big problems associated with it. And so the legislature stepped in to address it, relieving principals, you know, principals at schools, university presidents were um, frustrated because they now have bear the burden of this huge public issue. And so the legislature stepped in and, and uh, took the responsibility for them. Yeah, I'm glad that that happened because not only that, you know, I, I can understand or, well, I'm trying to understand. I'm not really understand. I can understand or try to understand if people feel the other way. If people feel like, okay, I was born as a female, but I feel like a man or vice versa. I try to understand that. I'm, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, but another thing, it's if you give the right to sick people that they're not really feeling that way, but to take advantage before this law, to take advantage of that opportunity to get into bathrooms uh, of female or male just because, oh, I feel that gender, I know this gender, and I have the right to feel whatever I feel and to get into the bathrooms, which is, that was another issue for, for like the last two years. Yes, well, what you're pointing out there is such a policy of, of allowing both uh, both sexes in that kind of close physical contact in situations of vulnerability is ripe for abuse. Even if actual um, actual patients suffering with gender dysphoria wouldn't themselves abuse it, it's open to the possibility that someone um, could abuse the the policy um, and commit assaults. And of course, in in for example, prison situations, that's exactly what has happened, and there are documented cases of it. So now let's move to uh, SB uh, 1403, securing our border. This has been like a big issue. Uh, it's been for decades. But not only that, I mean, of course, with COVID and then with the new administration, we've been seeing this problem getting worse and worse and worse. So explain to us what is this new law is going to impact our border. Yeah, so this new law does two things. One, it uh, authorizes the creation of an interstate compact to address the border. Uh, and two, it uh, creates, provides resources and authority to create uh, border barriers, border wall, uh, the, the buoys in the river, things like that. Uh, also surveillance and monitoring systems. So we can dig into both those parts a little bit. In the first case, and this is really fascinating part of this law, what has previously been left to the federal government to figure out, states are now taking upon themselves in their own authority, in their own right as states. This is a really interesting development in the relationship between states and the federal government. In this law, the way that works out is it authorizes the creation of a compact or a group of states that join together by agreement. Of course, it's going to be mostly border states um, to tackle parts of the border problem themselves 
when the fail when the uh, federal government is failing to do so, as um, as has been obvious that the federal government is profoundly failing to do so uh, in the recent past. The second thing it does then is allow for the creation of those border barriers um, with state with state money, and so it authorizes the state to do both those things. And then that has to do a lot also to support rural law enforcement, which is the SB twenty two. Yeah. So in a related bill, um, there is additional support this year for rural law enforcement. It's um, designated for counties with fewer than three hundred thousand people. What we have been seeing, of course, with the huge influx of people at the border and traffic at the border is that rural law enforcement can just get overwhelmed. They don't have the resources to deal with thousands and thousands, literally millions of people flooding across the border into mostly rural parts of Texas and other states. And so the legislature has um, has given additional resources and help and created a pathway for doing that for these rural counties so that so that, again, we can address the problem in a way. This is common sense, too. Right. We need to address the problem as close to the problem as we possibly can. And so that means not waiting for Uh, the illegal immigration problem to make its way all the way to Houston, all the way to Austin, all the way to San Antonio, but rather trying to enhance law enforcement's ability to interdict these problems where they're happening at the border. Many of those border counties are fairly rural. So that's uh, that's part of what's going on here. Yeah. And talking about that as another, uh, the HB6 is stopping the fentanyl, the fentanyl crisis. So that has to do also with the security in our border and also supports rural law enforcement because the fentanyl crisis is very, very big problem that we're having and opening the border, it's increasing the problem. Yes, what people have to understand, what all of us have to understand, because if fentanyl hasn't touched your life yet, it will. And um, it's important to understand how powerful this drug is. Um, It's extremely effective for pain relief in clinical, hospital, doctor-supervised situations of intense pain. Um, And it's great for that, but it's also extremely potent in very small amounts. And so a tiny misstep uh, with this drug results in death, many, many instances of that. And so what we're seeing at the border, part of the border crisis is the smuggling in of fentanyl, which is then laced into other drugs that are sold, ostensibly for a greater high. But again, you have to be extremely well-trained, highly qualified, and very careful in using fentanyl, or it will cause overdose and death. And we're seeing just massive tragedies across the country with respect to that. A number of instances where the first time someone used drugs, the first time they they smoked marijuana, it was laced with fentanyl and they died. The so now crisis fentanyl, that, yeah, yeah. Continue. Sorry, I was just gonna say. So now now fentanyl uh, now crimes related to fentanyl are felonies, and that that's what this that's what this legislation does. Yeah, so that that's important to know. So another crisis that also this legislature is, is touching is um, the supporting the mental health care. We have a big crisis. Mental health, I mean, it, it's been with us forever, but we're not, we were not paying attention so close. And I think uh, it, it happened with the pandemic that we start paying more attention to mental health. So uh, explain to us what it, this law is going hap- to do. Yeah, so uh, two years ago now, um, the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a national adolescent health, mental health state of emergency. And the conditions of that state of emergency continue right through to today. You're absolutely right. We're paying attention now to mental health in ways that we have not in the past. Um, And now that we are paying attention, what we're seeing is record high levels of anxiety, depression, loneliness, self-harm behavior, deaths of despair, suicide is sky high. And um, not just adults, but even teenagers are highly at risk for um, for all of these problems. It's ironic in a way because 
Americans are, by any fair historical reckoning, some of the materially wealthiest people ever to walk the face of the earth. Um, we just we have we live a normal middle class American lives with luxuries and comforts that a medieval king could only dream of, uh, and yet we are we have mental health deep and widespread mental health problems, and so. It is, um, it is really good to see the legislature turning some attention and devoting some resources to addressing this. And so they, they are now putting in place some resources to equip um, schools. Of course, schools are going to be the front lines for this. Um, and so equipping schools and, and other community agencies to, um, to assist in mental health, with particularly with young people. And you say something very important that you say, I mean, we're... we're you know, on average, we live a great life in this country because this is the land of opportunities. And I'm telling you uh, from my own experience, I'm from Colombia, uh, South America. I came here when I was uh, 25, like 25 years ago, and I was looking for the the land of opportunities. I was looking for opportunities. I came with a lot of dreams and I raised uh, two teenagers. They're now 18. They're twins and they're just I just put them in college. And that's something that I never understood, <clears throat> why this society is living on uh, depression and sadness and, and mental health issues when I say, like, they have everything. Why they, why they are sad? Why they're depressed if they have everything? Coming from a third world country that when we, you know, we don't have the luxury of the life that people in this country live. Now I'm living in this country for a reason. I left my country for a reason, looking for opportunities. I decide to have my kids in this country for a reason, not to have them in my country. And I love my country, but let's be honest. I mean, Latin America, Everybody wants to come to this country. Even people in Europe wants to come to this country. This is the land of opportunities. Everything is possible in this country. So that's something that I never understood. Why people in this country are lonely, why they're depressed, why they're sad if they have everything. So that's something that I don't get it. Sure. Well, a big part of the explanation is that when, when you... In many countries, Colombia perhaps is one of them, they may not be as materially wealthy as we are, but there's another form of wealth and it's those wealth of healthy relationships. And that's where we're experiencing some poverty in the US is in the quality of our relationships. Profound percentages of people, of adults, report having very few or even no close friends. So we're starved for friendship we have, um, we have problems with divorce and out of wedlock um, births. So we're starved for those relationships with our mothers and our fathers, particularly our fathers. And um, so th there's going to be a reckoning for all that. And we see some of that represented here in this legislation and an attempt by the state to step in in a positive way. So, you know, details on the, on the legislation, it creates a grant program to intervene in juvenile mental health prior to the justice system intervening, which I think is a really important step. He, before now, we have not intervened on mental health issues and questions related to teens really until they were involved or caught up in the justice system, whether it's child removal from homes in, by the uh, protective, uh, Family and Protective Services Department or um, or the juvenile justice system, you know, they went to court, they got arrested or got in trouble and wound up in court. And that's when the mental health services would kick in. This is an attempt to, to intervene before that and to equip communities to intervene before things get to that point. And that's a really strong positive step. But in the broader context, you're right, we're going to have, this won't be the last such legislation related to mental health and related to those interventions. Because as we've been saying, this problem is profound. It's affecting children, it's affecting adults, it's affecting families. Um, it's, it's really affecting all of us in our communities. And uh, this will be the start, but I think not the finish of uh, the need for Texas to intervene in, uh, in mental health. And the cherry on top, social media, that instead of connecting, is disconnecting. So we're having that problem not only uh, with uh, our uh, 
uh, teenagers and the kids these days, like, you know, you see, you go to a restaurant, you see a family of five or six or four, and they're all in the phones, and they're all, I mean, the, the little one, the one, two years old, they're already, he's already know how to manage the, the phone and the iPad perfectly. So instead of connecting, it's disconnecting us. And parents are, these days, young parents are like the best babysitter is technology. Yeah, the data on this is rather startling. Um, you see, so there's a there's a scholar known as Jean Twenge, that's her name, uh, who's really good with the data on these questions. And what you see is teen suicide and mental health and severe mental health problems began to skyrocket, not coincidentally, right about the time that uh, teenagers started to get smartphones, particularly the widespread use of the iPhone. I mean, look, I don't want to, the iPhone isn't it isn't particularly the iPhone's fault, but smartphones in general. Uh, that's I right. have four in front of uh, me. But you, you cannot see it, but I have four iPhones in front of me. I work with that. <laughs> yes, but it's, uh, but it's particularly startling when you see the data of teenagers get iPhones and other smartphones, and then suicide starts to skyrocket. And I think you're absolutely right that part of the problem there, a big part of the problem there, is the substitution of social media for real relationships. Um, and I think that's that's going to be something that all of us, parents, legislators, that's going to take a community-wide, everyone in Texas is going to have to, um, we're going to have to get clear about what these devices, what their role is in our life, um, when it's a help, when it's a good tool, and when it's harming us. And you know, people tend always to blame somebody else before to blame ourselves. People tend to blame technology, to blame social media. I don't blame technology, I don't blame social media, I blame parents. Uh, I am a mom, I am a strict mom. My kids were like, you know, they always say like, oh, Latina moms are there too much, and I don't care what they say. But I think it's our responsibility. We are the parents. They're not, we're, we're not, they're not telling us what to do. We're telling them what to do because we should, we're supposed to know better. So I think it's a big responsibility in parents these days to control what is going on because we cannot keep blaming. Technology is here and it's gonna stay forever and it's not gonna get, it's not gonna stay there. It's gonna get worse or for or better i don't know i mean but but it's gonna it's gonna get better you you know we're, we're getting more tech and more tech and we need to learn how to manage technology but we also need to learn how to manage the time with our kids and the quality time without technology so we need to it, it's a it's a hard it's a hard work and i don't think the legislature is going to fix that no that's absolutely right um, you know, this, you're, you're absolutely right that the first and foremost responsibility belongs to those of us who are parents. I'm also a, a parent. I'm a father. I have three boys. And, you know, the difficult thing for me as a scholar is when you start reading the data and reading more and more data, you get it's more and more confirmed how frightening all of this is. But it's hard actually to talk about it without sounding like a crazy person, because if I just tell your viewers and listeners Parents, trust me, I've read the data. What you need to do is take away the smartphones from your kids. They will think I am a crazy person, but I promise you that that is what the data tells us all that we should that we should be doing. Absolutely. OK, so let's move to um, uh, bans local COVID mandates. So what is uh, now now that we've been seeing cases of COVID and the new variant of COVID. So what is that in the new law SB 29? Yes, so COVID has now joined the sort of family of diseases that we're going to have cyclical bouts with, right? Just like there's a flu season, there will now be sort of regular COVID seasons. It will, it will crop up and we'll get a lot of cases and then it will die down again and then it will happen all over again, right? So it'll be like the flu. What the state of Texas has now said um, is no mask mandates, no vaccine mandates, no school closures, no business lockdowns. We've been there. We've done that. We're not going back. That's great. 
Amen for that. <laughs> so uh, let's move to HB3, increasing school safety. Definitely this one is very, very, very important. Not only because of the mass shooting, but in all cases, we need to uh, make sure that our kids are safe. When we send our kids to school, I mean, to me in my head, that's the most security place that I can send my kids. And unfortunately, it's not always that case. Yeah, so of course this bill happens in the shadow of the Uvalde shooting, not the only one, but of course the most high profile one. And so the legislature here is attempting to enhance security uh, for schools. I think really important here is to note that this is a yet another bill where mental health issues are being addressed because there's money and provision within the bill to add mental health resources for schools. Yeah, that's very important. And I think um, us as a um, society, and that also has to do with the rural, rural uh, supporting rural law enforcement, I think that also has to do with uh, Uvalde. We saw, I mean, uh, many law enforcement in that uh, situation that they were not with the um, current training and they were not ready. Yes, yeah, you're absolutely right that here we have a, another instance where, you know, the most precious thing to any of us who are parents are our children. We would lay down our own lives for them. And we require, we demand of law enforcement and school officials that they be ready to do the same as long as they are in a supervisory role over our children. And that's a lot to ask. And so officers need proper training, proper equipment, um, you know, all the resources necessary for them to, to fulfill that duty um, because our children are very vulnerable in those situations and uh, we are very vulnerable in, as parents, placing responsibility for our children's health, well-being and learning. It's an awesome responsibility that we hand over to principals and teachers and the law enforcement officials who help them do that. And it's good and right that the state of Texas is providing additional resources to help them fulfill that responsibility. And because our kids are very vulnerable, uh, I, I believe uh, they also create the, or, or, or wrote the HB 900, uh, removes expli uh, explicit materials from a school library. So tell us about that one. Yes, yeah, so there are a number of books around the country that have been creating enormous controversy. We are not talking about, this is like not your grandfather's banned book sort of idea yeah, of where course. there were controversial <laughs> ideas. In fact, the legislation specifically forbids removing a book because of a controversial idea. What it targets is sexually explicit material. I have seen, unfortunately, I've had to see some of these books. And the content is simply shocking, appalling. And it's, and it's just unconscionable that it's in the children's, either the children's section of a public library or in a school library at all. It has no business there. And the legislature stepped in to try to get a handle on this because we're not talking about one or two books. We're talking about dozens of books in recent years that have been published often graphic novels. So we're not only talking about sexually explicit words on the page, we're talking about drawn images of children engaged in sexual activity, of children and adults engaged in sexual activity. I mean, it is extreme, um, it is disturbing. And that's what's being, you know, there's a lot of legal language in the bill that often these bills are kind of boring to read, right? Because they're technical legal jargon. But the actual material that's covered by this uh, bill is is anything but boring. It is shocking. Absolutely. I mean, it's like uh, we don't have enough with all the TV shows, the new TV shows. And, and now we have a lot of uh, streaming platforms that our kids have access. And they already seen that on the movies, on the shows, on the cartoons, because the cartoons these days is not even close to the cartoons in our time. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, 
is like is not enough with what the, uh, our kids are exposed with the internet with the social media with the tv shows with the cartoons that now we have to put them on the schools well you're absolutely right look we parents have to be extremely vigilant these days with what our kids are looking at online what they see on tv it seems common sense that there ought to be a place that's safe for kids to have freedom to roam where their childhood is not going to be threatened by anything they find on the shelf in their school library. That doesn't seem too much to ask. And so what the state of Texas is requiring in this legislation, um, which of course is being challenged in the courts, is for vendors to label, so the people selling the books to the schools, to label books that have sexually explicit material so that schools will know and won't buy or shelve or catalog those books. Um, and of course, again, this, this legislation is being held up in court. We don't yet know how it will turn out. But look, to me as a dad, you know, take my political science professor hat off and put my dad hat on. I want the library to, to be a, the kind of place for my kids that it was for me in my childhood. When we got to go to the library, we were free. My mom had her books and she would sit at a table and we were in the children's section and we could roam amongst the shelves. We could pull any book we wanted. We got to explore all that the world had to offer us. And my mom could feel safe that what we were going to find there was healthy and wholesome and would enhance and increase our knowledge and wonder about the world and not do damage to us and not end our childhood on the spot. But you can't actually have that confidence right now. And so what the Texas legislature here is doing is trying to help restore libraries as a place of freedom for children where um, sexually explicit materials aren't stalking them from the shelves. Yeah, that's very, very sad that um, as a parents, we have a biggest challenge, not only I mean, the biggest challenge that we have when we become a parent is like no, nobody taught us how to be a parent, right? So right there is a big challenge. And now facing all of these things outside of the world because we can do so much inside of our house, but, you know, try to control everything around them. It's, it's almost impossible. I mean, these laws help, but at the same time, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's this much that they can do. Because we as a parents, the law, the law enforcement, the teachers, means like everybody trying to prevent to damage the kids, but at the same time, many people trying to damage them. And, and why our kids? You know, I didn't see this never before. I mean, my kids are 18. I don't know how old are your kids, but I didn't see that in elementary when my kids were in elementary school. I started seeing these the last probably five, six years, and even worse the last three years. Yeah, I think it's, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and it's a question worth asking, why is it so important to those who are suing to block this law? Why is it so important to them that children have access to sexually explicit material? To my mind, there is no good answer to that question. All the answers will be bad. Absolutely. So let's move to the um, one of the two last ones, the HB 1243 felony for illegal voting that also has to do with the SB 1070 protecting elections from fraud. So explain to us because we're going to have uh, elections in November and we're going to have the presidential elections next year. And we know that we're being uh, talking about uh, uh, elect, uh, elections or fraud in elections, not only in the presidential election in 2020, but also here in Harris County with the, with the uh, Harris County judge position. So we've been talking about that a lot lately. Not that before we were not talking about that or it was not any case, but uh, probably since 2020, it's been like the daily talking in politics. Yes, yeah, so there's been a lot of attention the last few years on shoring up or tightening down a lot of the weak spots within our within our voting system to make sure 
that every person who casts a vote is the person who's on the rolls to cast the vote and only does so once. And uh, these two measures both seek to do that. Um, one is, again, another interesting instance of where we see states collaborating with each other, states beginning to work in concert, uh, or maybe not beginning to work, but working more in concert with one another rather than isolated. So um, the first one of those, uh, SB 1070, uh, it, what it does is establish a process for working with other states to determine when someone is registered in multiple states so that they are only registered in one state to vote. Previously, this hasn't been done. I mean, I have moved from one state to the other. And of course, when you do that, you often move your voter registration. But since the states weren't communicating, what it often meant is people quite innocently were registered technically to vote in two states at once, in the new state where they just registered and in the old state where they, where they no longer live but used to vote. And so what this, what this legislation does is start to create in, more interstate cooperation so that someone's only registered to vote in one place. Um, the second bit, so that's you know, kind of on the government side. Then you've got something on the citizen side. The second piece of legislation makes it a second degree felony to commit voter fraud. So this is enhancing the penalty, trying to create um, more deterrence, right? So this stiffens the penalties for voter fraud, which will decrease the likelihood that someone would be willing to do it because it's now a felony offense to do so. So I see um, the highlights of the, um, the laws that we talk today, along with the 700 plus that is being, uh, that it took place on September 1st. I've been seeing these very, uh, try to, um, to be very conservative, to bring values, to highlight the values of the family, to highlight the values that we thought that it was a common sense before and seems like it's no longer like that. Yes. So overall, a very conservative uh, session and a number of a number of things that conservatives can be happy about from this session. Of course, no session is perfect. Um, and there are still some uh, th there has already been a special session after the regular session. And there uh, there may yet be I don't think they're done yet. Um, there probably will be another special session. This one all about education. So We've talked through a lot of things that the legislature has done this year, but they may not be finished yet because the governor can always call the legislature back into special session. Only the governor can do that. And he can give them a specific charge, a specific issue that they are to deal with. And everyone is anticipating that later this month, we will hear a call for potentially an October special session regarding education where of course the forefront issue there will be educational savings accounts or ESAs, which would give parents more choice uh, and make state money follow children rather than following school buildings. Okay, well, we'll see what's gonna happen. Well, what would be the, the call to action professor for all of us try to understand these, uh, all these laws that are taking place? Well, I think it is to uh, talk with your local state representative or your state senator. They are uh, always more welcoming than we would think, uh, perhaps, for people to call them up and ask them questions about what they were done, what they did during the session. Uh, I always encourage people to to get to know their their local state representative and state senator. And my call to action is please parents, you know, Google, Google will tell you everything. So understand the laws. So that way you understand what is your rights and, and what is being done. So we need to also do our homework as a parents and as a society, as a community, even if you're parent or not, all these laws impact our daily life. So we need to do our homework. We cannot just let them do the laws. 
we also need to do our homework to understand. And if we are not agree on something, as you said, uh, Professor, we need to uh, call our uh, state representative because we are the one that put them there and they work for us. So that's why it's important to communicate with them. Well, Dr. Stewart, thank you so much from University of St. Thomas. As always, that university has always been amazing with us, helping us and help our viewers to understand everything that is going on, not only in politics, education, and health. Everything has to do with politics, but understand what we are saying these days with all these new laws and, and any uh, aspect in our life. Thank you so much, and thank you to Sandra Solis that always helping us to put this together. My pleasure, Andrea. Glad to be back. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, you guys, for tuning with us uh, today. Texas Latino Conservatives, please visit us at texaslatinoconservatives.com and you're going to have the list of our um, uh, upcoming events. You're going to have a lot of information in English and Spanish. Of course, Texas Latino Conservatives is dedicated to our conservative community, always helping to understand not only the laws, but to understand everything that it has to do with our conservative issues. Also, we help through our Leadership Latino program, um, help uh, people that want to run for office from A to Z to understand how is the process to uh, run for office, to become a public office, and to run for public office and you can understand not only how to file for that, but also uh, how to deal with media, how to do with the compliance, the ethics, and everything that has to do when you run for office. It's, it's a very complex uh, process, but here the Texas Latino Conservatives, we are helping you to understand that and we want leaders like you we want you to be the voice of your community and if you have a desire to do that just contact us participate in our leadership latino class that we just have one at the beginning of august we're going to have another one at the end of january 2024 so always stay tuned with us not only with our website but also with our show TLC Live every Wednesday at 11 in the morning. Muchísimas gracias por habernos acompañado y nos vemos el próximo miércoles. Chao, chao.